I returned to Baker Street from a short holiday in the spring of 1891. I had seen little of Holmes for some time. I saw in the papers that he had been engaged by the French government upon a matter of supreme importance but I could hardly foresee that it would have so violent a consequence. It lies with me now to tell for the first time what took place between Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Professor Moriarty in that fateful year. Ah, Mrs. Hudson, has Mr. Holmes returned? Oh, he has indeed. He came in early, must have been before seven. Morning, Mrs. Hudson, he says. Have you anything nice for my breakfast? <laughs> As if he hadn't been away for four months. <laughs> you could have knocked me down with a feather. And he's gone out again, I take it? Yes, yes, he had his breakfast and then he went out again just after his visitor left. Visitor? Hmm. An elderly gentleman. They had words. I didn't like the look of him. Not at all, I didn't. He had a face like, like the wrath of God. Or should I say the devil? Indeed. And where should we open a bottle of the best claret to celebrate Mr. Holmes' return? Why not? <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. I learned later that Holmes had survived three attempts on his life that very day. But as I waited for him to reappear, Baker Street looked to me as safe and secure as ever. What is it? 
air guns. A rather special air gun, in fact. Watson, would you have any objection to drawing the blinds? Casually. As if you were alone in this room. understand that I am by no means a nervous man. But it is stupidity rather than courage to refuse to recognize danger when it is close upon you. Watson, might I have a match? Your heart. Scratches, nothing, nothing to signify. You don't look well, Holmes. Well, I have been using myself rather too freely. I have been somewhat pressed of late. How pressed? Well, as I am unable to leave this room until after dark, and then most likely by the way that I came, we do have some time on our hands. Also, I owe you an explanation for my unceremonious departure the last time that we met. I'll take some notes, if I may. Oh, by all means. This case, this case, it is unique in the annals of crime. You will recall that it was a cold morning early in the year when I last left Baker Street. I had no idea where I was going or who my client was. All I knew that was important and abroad. My destination was the museum in the Louvre in Paris. And my client, none less than the French government. Surely this Palais du Louvre is near to the very heart of France. It was here that the great Roi Soleil held court, and here that Napoleon Bonaparte was married to the Archduchess Marie-Louise of Austria. Indeed, it is a history lesson in stone. And now this gallery contains our finest paintings. Gentlemen, shall we come to the point? I presume the Mona Lisa has been stolen. Qui le lui a dit? Je vous assure, Monsieur le Ministre, je n'ai absolument rien dit. When I see two hooks, and the place where the Mona Lisa used to hang, and then this talk of peril and scandal. Yes, now I begin to understand the delicacy of the matter. The Louvre is closed on Mondays for maintenance. The fact that the Mona Lisa was not hanging in her usual place was put down to the fact that she was in the photographic studio. It was only later in the day that a workman found the frame in a little storeroom under the Salon Carré. Uh, we put the, the glass over the painting only a month ago. We feared an acid attack. There was such a one in Florence recently. How very fortunate. Pardon? Two good thumbprints. Many artists come here to make copies of the paintings. This one seems well done. Yes, that artist is particularly clever and makes a good living from his copying. I should like to meet him sometime. A bad copy is very easy, but a good one. 
It takes years of practice. For instance, Da Vinci used Italian poplar wood to paint on. It is very difficult to find. To mix the original color, nearly impossible. Is uh, fumature, the smooth blended tones, oh, is very it? subtle. And his brushwork is left-handed. Uh, the crackler, this uh, fine network of cracks. La? Ah, that is the most difficult to achieve of all. And you can achieve it. How? Ah. That is my secret. It seems to me that this is something near to a legitimate forgery. Uh, no, 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 because the copies must never be the same size as the original. Uh, and who would buy one of my copies as the original when the real Mona Lisa is in the Louvre? But if by chance the Mona Lisa is no longer in the Louvre. Oh, but of course you are joking, monsieur. Happily, the French police are well ahead of the British when it comes to fingerprints. The great Batillon himself was kind enough to refer to my little pamphlet on the subject as his Bible. As I suspected, our man had been involved in petty crime in the past. A Spaniard named Mendoza. There. There is your thief. Hmm. Not a pleasant specimen. <laughs> Mr. Holmes... France owes you a great debt. We have not got the man. And more important, the painting. But he must be arrested immediately. He may have already sold it. No, 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 gentlemen. It is my belief that the painting is still in Mendoza's keeping. He is only a pawn in a much bigger game. This robbery has been carefully planned over months, even years, by a master criminal. But what professional criminal would want to own the Mona Lisa? That is madness. He can't sell it. I believe the master criminal is not interested in the original. If he can pass off the forgeries as originals for the same price. Gentlemen, we must alarm Mendoza. Get him on the move. So he leads us to the center of the web. But how? First, we must announce to the world that the painting has been stolen. Oh, but that would create a great scandal, both myself and the director. Minister, please, if I may explain. It will be announced that owing to the brilliant and tireless efforts of yourself and the director, that the criminal is about to be arrested. We must arrest him now. No. I understand that the recovery of the original would make it impossible for the thieves to sell any copies, however excellent those copies were. But did you have any clue to the identity of the mastermind behind the whole scheme? I was satisfied that I had recognized one of Professor Moriarty's agents. Moriarty? Notice the subtle modeling of the 
features, beautiful hands, mood, that smile. As Walter Pater described her, the head upon which all the ends of the world are come and the eyelids are a little weary. No one else has ever had the genius to paint this masterpiece, except Da Vinci. Well, if you look at the paintwork, sir. Leonardo's signature writ large. The brushwork, mano sinistra. The bloom, the sfumato technique. Will you excuse me? I would say, without hesitation, that the general opinion of the art world is that this is the greatest portrait ever painted. I very much regret to have to tell you, sir, that this painting is no longer for sale. I don't understand, Professor. I mean, uh, the price, maybe? Well, now, look, I'll reconsider. I'll give you a cool four million. How's that? I'm sorry, Mr. Morgan. The painting is no longer for sale. Huh? Hey. What you guys up to? Take your hands off me, you make! For sakes, for nothing! Get lost! Richard Holmes has recovered the original. These are worthless. Destroy them. Burn them! Do it yourself. Let no one else see you. Yes, Professor Moriarty. Congratulate you, Holmes. Such an honor, and so well deserved. That was no great problem. The case practically solved itself. I, uh, I hear you had a visitor this morning. Ow! Oh! I had not been back in Baker Street more than half an hour when. But you cannot go up there, sir. Less frontal development than I should have expected. It's a dangerous habit to finger loaded firearms in the pocket of one's dressing gown. You evidently don't know me. On the contrary, I think it's fairly evident that I do. I can spare you five minutes, if you have anything to say. All that I have to say has already crossed your mind. And possibly my answer has already crossed yours. You stand fast. Absolutely.
You frustrated me in the affair of the French gold. Ah. Oh. So it was you behind the red-headed league. A very ingenious and well-contrived idea. High praise from you. You crossed my path first on the 4th of January. By the middle of February, I was seriously inconvenienced by you. And at the end of March, I was absolutely hampered in my plans. And now, with this last business in France, you have placed me in such a position by your continual persecution that I am in positive danger of losing my liberty. The situation is becoming an impossible one. Have you any suggestion to make? You must drop it, Mr. Holmes. You really must, you know. And what if I refuse? I'm quite sure that a man of your intelligence will see that there can be but one outcome to this affair. It is necessary that you should withdraw. You have worked things in such a fashion that we have only one resource left. It has been an intellectual treat to me to see the way in which you've grappled with this matter. But I say, unaffectedly, that it would be a grief to me to be forced to take an extreme measure. <laughs> oh, you smile, sir. But it really would, I do assure you. Dangerous part of my trade. This is not danger. It is inevitable destruction. You stand in the way not merely of an individual, but of a mighty organization, the full extent of which even you, with all your cleverness, have been unable to realize. You must stand clear, Mr. Holmes, or be trodden underfoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Well, well, it seems a pity, but I've done what I could. This is a duel between you and me, Mr. Holmes. You hope to place me in the dock. You hope to beat me. If you are clever enough to bring destruction on me, rest assured, I shall do as much for you. You have paid me several compliments, Mr. Moriarty. Let me pay you one in return when I say that if I were assured of the former eventuality, I would, in the interests of the public, cheerfully accept the latter. I can promise you the one, but not the other! Is the Napoleon of crime, Watson. For years I have endeavored to break through the veil which shrouded him. And at last, I have seized a thread and followed it to Moriarty himself. And now I'm ready to close on him. If he doesn't close upon you first. On Monday, next, matters 
will be ripe. The professor and all the principal members of his gang will be in the hands of the police. Then will come the greatest criminal trial of the century. The clearing up of over 40 mysteries and the rope for all of them. I, I cannot do better than to get away for the few remaining days. It would give me great pleasure, Watson, if you would come onto the continent with me. The continent? I'd be delighted, Holmes, but where? Anywhere. It's all the same to me. Yes, but won't we have to dispose of Professor Moriarty first? It seems to me that we're under siege in this very room. Now, that reminds me. I must be on my way. Won't you stay the night? No, it's too dangerous for you if I stay here. I will leave the way I came and find lodgings with my brother Mycroft. We start tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning? Oh, yes, it is most necessary. Now, here are your instructions, and I beg of you to follow them to the letter. We are now playing a double-handed game with me, Watson, against the most powerful syndicate of criminals in Europe. You will dispatch whatever luggage you intend to take by trusty messenger unaddressed to Victoria Station tonight. In the morning, you will send Mrs. Hudson for a handsome cab. Desiring her not to take the first or second which may present itself. You will drive to the strand end of Lotha Mews handing the address to the cabman with a request that he will not throw it away. Oh. Have your fare ready and the instant that your cab stops Move speedily through the mews and time yourself to reach the other end at exactly a quarter past nine, where you will find a small broom waiting, close to the curb driven by a fellow with a heavy black coat tipped at the collar with red. Into this you will step, and you will reach Victoria in time for the Continental Express. You speak Italian. No, I'm afraid not. I'm looking for the gentleman who reserved this compartment. It's not a sign of him, sir. If you're travelling, you better get aboard. My dear Watson, you haven't even condescended to say good morning to me. Good heavens, Holmes. How you startled me. Oh, it is still necessary to take every precaution. Rather fine, Watson. 
I see that this express runs in connection with the boat. So I think we've shaken off Moriarty very effectively. Mm. Well, what will he do then? What I should do? Engage a special train. But he'll arrive too late. You will observe from your Bradshaw that this train stops at Canterbury and again at the boat. Moriarty will catch us there. But heavens, anybody would think that we were the criminals. Let's arrest him as soon as he arrives. Oh, that would ruin everything. We should catch the big fish, but the smaller would dart right and left out of the net. No, no, no. And the rest is inadmissible. Well, what then? But Holmes, our luggage. We must give Moriarty something to follow. What do we do? We shall go across country. Here we are, Holmes. Bradshaw, sell them let you down. From Ashford Junction, we can take the one o'clock slow train to Hastings. Then on to the dear old London, Brighton and South Coast Line. Bexhill to Lewis non-stop. Then on to New Haven, evening boat to the end. I think we've got time for an early lunch. So soon. There are limits, you see, to even our friends' intelligence. And now, Watson, we shall treat ourselves to a couple of carpet bags, encourage the manufacturers of the countries through which we travel, and make our way at leisure into Switzerland via Brussels, Luxembourg, and Bath. It fell out as Sherlock Holmes had predicted. We stayed two nights in Brussels and then began to make our leisurely way southeast. For a charming week, we progressed towards the Alps. What do you think? A common enough occurrence in the mountains. Gang safely secured, only Moriarty escaped the net, signed Michael. He's given them the slip. I think it would be better if you were to return to England, Watson. Why? You will find me a very dangerous companion now. 
Moriarty will devote all his energies to taking his revenge upon me. But if I have a companion, would you be rid of me? No. Except for the reasons I've given. We've been in tight places before together. Never as tight as this one. I'm not leaving you, Holmes. Not unless you order me to go. I'd never been to Switzerland before, but the beauty of the landscape reminded me irresistibly of the northwest frontier provinces of India. But, in spite of the lovely scenery all round us, it was clear to me that never for one instant did Sherlock Holmes forget the shadow that lay across him. that go where we would, we would not be clear of the danger that was dogging our footsteps. See anything? No, nothing. It's time we were on our way. Pants, we're on our way. At last, we reached the heart of the Bernese Overland and came to the village of Meiringen where we put up at the Englischer Hof, then kept by Peter Steiler the Elder.
The walk over the hills to Rosenlaue is very beautiful. You can stay the night there and come back the next day, but you must not on any account miss the falls of Reichenbach. It's only a small detour. Uh, ah, there it is. Also, gute Reise. Mm. Dankeschön. place. The torrent, swollen by the melting glacier, plunges into a tremendous abyss, in which the spray rolls up like the smoke from a burning house. Dr. Watson. Yes? Herr Steiler told me to give you this. It is very urgent. It seems an English woman was taken to the hotel after we left, on her way to friends in Lucerne. She's had a grave hemorrhage. Tuberculosis. Ah, no doubt. It appears she's dying. An English doctor would be a great consolation. I'm afraid I must go back, Holmes. Of course. Now, Styler suggests that this lad shows you the way to Rosenlaue, and I'll join you there later. A good plan. She's no worse. Bitte? You didn't write this? There is no sick English woman at the hotel? No. But it has a hotel mark. Of course. There was a tall old Englishman who came here after you had gone. He said...
It was the sight of the Alpenstock that turned me cold and sick. He had not gone to Rossenlau. I stood for a minute or two to collect myself, for I was dazed with the horror of the thing. And then I began to think of Holmes's own methods and to try to practice them. Dear Watson, I write these few lines through the courtesy of Mr. Moriarty, who awaits my convenience for the final discussion of those questions which lie between us. I am pleased to think that I shall be able to free society from any further effects of his presence, though I fear that it is at a cost which will give pain to my friends, and especially, my dear Watson, to you. As you know, my career had, in any case, reached a crisis, and no possible conclusion to it could be more congenial to me than this. Indeed, if I may make a full confession to you, I was convinced that the letter from Meiringen was a hoax. I made every disposition of my property before leaving England and handed it to my brother, Mycroft. Goodbye. And good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. In this situation, I had little doubt that a personal contest between the two men ended as it could hardly fail to end. It's with a heavy heart that I take up my pen to write these, the last words in which I shall ever record the singular gifts by which my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, was distinguished. 
shall ever regard him as the best and the wisest man I have ever known.